their brothers and sisters, mums and dads, friends and neighbours, but most importantly they're human beings who deserve the same dignity and respect as anyone else in our society. Tomorrow we'll see the publication of the latest statistics for drug deaths uh, that happened before the COVID pandemic. Uh, the numbers were 11,000, uh, sorry, 1,187 uh, people die in 2018 from a preventable death. Most of, most of them living in or born in uh, areas where there is material deprivation. If this carnage was happening in middle class areas in our leafy suburbs or the nice commuter villages amongst people with power and influence and political agency, it would have been addressed as a national priority. It, just like COVID, would have had money thrown at it, actions taken, immediate actions taken. But I have to ask, where is the daily statement from political leaders about the drugs deaths, public health emergency? Where is the rush of money to prevent the deaths in their streets? Where are the urgent parliamentary debates or the emergency funding? Where is the national leadership and who has been held to account? We've got the worst record in the developed world and this is to our national shame. Uh, this event is a real opportunity to build and grow effective collaboration to discuss how we can and should work to deliver change and improve outcomes for this marginalised population and to end these unnecessary deaths within our communities. Um, this afternoon you'll hear from speakers who will highlight uh, a, a broad range of issues, um, but one of them being the critical requirement of adopting a right, rights-based approach to substance misuse and the wider socio-economic inequalities that go with it. You'll hear about the challenges of implementing policies in local areas where people are dying. Our speakers will discuss the challenges of delivering services in Scotland. And you'll hear from, hear from those who campaign tirelessly to change our drug laws and from individuals who deliver uh, services on the front line. Time is limited. We have uh, a number of speakers who will have 10 minutes maximum and I'll let them know. I've got a wee uh, homemade sign to hand put up when they've got a minute to go. Um, so please take heed of that. Uh, I don't want to end up cutting people off, that's not the point of the meeting, but try and stick to your 10 minutes. Um, we've left a bit of time for questions later. Now given that at the moment we've got 260 people participating, if it was a normal meeting we would have hands in the air and I would ask you for questions. That's going to be really difficult. So at the end we'll ask people to post in the chat box any questions and, and I'll ask them to try and make this a bit more manageable. If there's any questions that don't need, uh, don't get an answer, don't worry, we'll save these in the chat function and we'll get them answered and we'll respond to you uh, in some way. Because um, it's important that we have that discussion, it's not just, you're just not here to sit and listen to people you're here to participate. Um, this is only the start, we hope, of uh, a discussion, an inclusive discussion, so that we can take forward a collaborative approach uh, to this uh, issue. Um, and at the end, we, we've got a few asks for you to uh, undertake. So, um, without any further ado, I'll pass over to our first speaker, who is Ian McPhee. Just let me find my list here. Um, Ian McPhee from the University of West of Scotland. Ian has presented several alternative narratives on the unacceptable rise in the number of drug deaths. He's co-authored critical analysis of policy failures in alcohol and drug service provision. He has also evaluated a rights-based training approach with alcohol and drug service provision and uh, has provided evidence to the Scottish and UK parliaments. Uh, over to you, Ian. Thanks, Neil. I think the size of this event indicates a clear need for an alternative to the stage-managed narrative that emerges from government and from individuals and services dependent on government funding. Now, we need to hear alternative explanations why Scotland has such a high rate of drug-related death. Now, we've been informed that our shocking high rates of drug death are due to an ageing cohort or to Thatcherite policies of the 1980s. What we know is this in Scotland, being over 35 is not and never should be classed as being part of an ageing cohort. And I believe it's shocking that the Scottish Government are allowed to promote this narrative. Attempts by the Scottish Government to distance themselves from the impact 
of policies that they have chosen or the drug strategies they've implemented require to be called out. The current government strategy with a focus on medical intervention begins with a very convenient assumption. The problem use of substances is an individual problem, where the individual is the cause of the problem and that all interventions and assessments focus on fixing that is what defective in the individual. This conveniently ignores the environment in which they live, where they are stigmatised, criminalised and discriminated against as individuals. It is in this way that politicians, service purchasers, service providers and law enforcement can ignore the impact that they have on the problems the individuals are experiencing. Now, the work I've conducted with Steve Aron, Barry Sheridan on drug death explains that the number of drug deaths amongst under 35s is rising. And while there is an ageing cohort, it does not explain the rapid rise in drug death that we saw occurring from 2010, as the policy document from 2008 began to shape responses to drug problems. We also criticised the adherence to drug-free recovery as a definition of healthy functioning, which in itself creates very high barriers to accessing treatment and may be one of the most significant causes of unplanned discharge in treatment services. And we demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that the deaths were occurring in those areas where services had closed down or had been centralised. This year, we examined the Audit Scotland 2009 report that made several assumptions to the Scottish Government and these were ignored. The recommendations were simple to implement and yet 10 years later in their 2019 Audit Scotland report, there was very little that could be claimed as a success of policy or strategy. In 2018, with funding from Glasgow Council on Alcohol, we evaluated REACH Advocacy, a rights-based advocacy service based in Cope Bridge in the west of Scotland. We recruited a sample of service users in contact with both drug and alcohol services, mental health services and the rights-based advocacy service and explored the participants' experiences of each of these services. We found that our most vulnerable individuals were brutalised by the actions of the Department of Work and Pensions, by criminal justice social work, by housing, by employers, and were amongst, these people were amongst the first to be regular users of food banks. We published our findings in late 2018 and warned what would happen if we continued to demonise and scapegoat the most vulnerable individuals and dismiss their concerns about benefits being cut because they would not stop using drugs. We were shocked at the actions of the Department of Work and Pensions, with sanctions being used as blunt instruments to force individuals into treatment. We were shocked at the actions of criminal justice social work, trying to prevent child neglect and in so doing, removing children from parents identified as risk factors simply because they were known to services as problem substance users, further acting as major barriers to their recovery. We also recruited a sample of service providers and what they informed us about the lack of accountability in services also shocked us. And while we were not critical of the workers or even the managers of these services, we were critical and are critical of government inaction where they redirect funds from where they were needed in the local areas where drug deaths are occurring to where they were assumed to be most efficiently used. We were critical of the integrated joint boards and the National Health Service who made decisions about who was deserving of a service and we warned about what would happen if we as a society allowed our most vulnerable to be stigmatised and discriminated against and left to die. Our comments were discussed, dismissed back in 2018 as hyperbole and exaggeration. So how has this situation been allowed to happen? In 1948, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights indicated in their 30 articles that human rights were indisputable and should be enjoyed by all. But in 1961, the United Nations Convention on Narcotic Drugs described drugs and drug users as evil that threatened mankind. This paved the way for the United Kingdom's Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. And after decades of criminalising drug users for simply possessing substances that the United Nations had described as evil, 
paving the way for stigma and discrimination. The new Scottish Government policy document Rights, Respect and Recovery does show some promise and the new MAT standards hopefully will allow more than just treatment waiting times to be claimed as a success. So recognising the human rights or recognising service users as rights holders and services and government services as duty bearers is essential. All duty bearers, and that includes Scottish Government, everyone who advises on policy, works and services, including academics, have to respect and recognise the rights of rights holders. Not just those individuals who have made the very difficult decision to remain abstinent from their former drugs of choice, but all, including current drug users. We cannot allow governments to reduce stigma for drug users simply by increasingly stigmatising users of alcohol tobacco and the users of medicines that are not prescribed to them. Rights begin with the understanding that if we allow one group or one individual to be reduced to a number or a service, we dehumanise them. If you do not support the rights of all, then you cannot be said to be working from a basis of human rights. Rights for some are no rights at all. Our recommendations arise from 30 years of experience in this field. We cannot expect the same services to do the same things, call it by a different name and expect better results. It is imperative that we work with communities, not just individuals who label themselves as in recovery, but current service users and those individuals who work in non-statutory services and acknowledge the power imbalance that exists between statutory and non-statutory services. Help begins by recognising their rights, not simply documenting their needs or by giving them approved drugs or advice on how to stop, but by accepting that simply asking the questions dictated by meeting the new standards or by the DAISY assessment tool is not a recognition of their human rights. It is a method of data collection, useful to be sure to government, but useless in understanding local needs where the drug deaths are occurring. Meeting government targets will allow governments to demonstrate and indicate success to be sure. However, this approach requires the continuance of a system that has served to increase these drug deaths. We ask only one thing of you, those of you who work with drug users who have not been able to stop or cut down or reduce their use. They need your help. They need you to recognise their human rights. We ask that you sign our open letter to the First Minister and also add your name to our petition to recognise drug-related deaths, drug-related deaths amongst the poor as a public health emergency and as deserving of the monies that are being used currently to tackle COVID-19. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. Thank you for that and getting us a underway. Um, our next speaker is Barry Sheridan, who's an independent consultant who's affiliated to the University of West of Scotland. Barry works alongside Ian and has co-authored several papers presenting alternative explanations to the rise in drugs deaths and has presented evidence to the Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs. He has developed policy across a range of uh, uh, social policy areas for around 15 years. Okay, Barry? Uh, thanks, Neil. Thanks for introducing us and thanks for chairing the event. And as I said to you earlier, you'll be a, a loss to the Scottish Parliament, uh, not just in terms of this policy area, but standing up for the rights of people who have no got a voice. And Ian, thanks for your comments as well. And more importantly, thanks everybody for logging in. Again, hopefully this will be only the beginning of where we can come together and make meaningful change. Today I'll talk to two points. One is I see the systemic policy failure across many levels of governments and put forward recommendations for improvement. Secondly, I will put forward that problematic substance use and drug deaths are area-based problems that require area-based solutions, again with recommendations for improvement. And for me, that's still ongoing in public health emergency. It's not an abstract social media discussion, but a decimation of communities who have been done unto for decades. 7,031 preventable deaths in the past 10 years, but there's no rush to declare a public health emergency. The annual total of death has not risen overnight, 
but doubled in the past decade. Again, patience has been asked for. However, we come up to the 10th anniversary of the Christie Commission, which advocated for public policy reform. Is a delay to act on this policy area due to it affecting the poorest and most marginalised communities in society who don't have the same agency, voice or resources as their more affluent neighbours? And again, people touched on it before. Well, there's been a lot of discussion about over, over drug policy reform and the introduction of safer injection sites. It's imperative that we don't lose sight that in all treatment outcome studies provide evidence that the vast majority of people who access services they actually want to tackle their problematic substance use and go on with their lives. As a Scottish society, you can't keep saying the big boy done it and ran away. Neither can politicians keep playing constitutional football in this matter at the expense of people's lives. You have to be open-handed, inclusive, collaborative, working across all sectors, not just in terms of addiction, involving all communities in the design, development and delivery of solutions. Systems leadership is required across all levels of governance. No longer can solutions for this public health emergency or the narrative be managed, controlled or solely developed by organisations appointed by or funded by government. And again, in terms of funding, over the past decades, the budget specifically allocated by the Scottish Government to alcohol drug partnerships have been cut by more than half from an annual budget of £114 million to £53.8 million, and that's between 2007 and 2019. And again, although there's been austerity measures placed by the Westminster Coalition Government between 2010 and 2015, the size of the cuts were no near half. The cuts were made consciously or unconsciously by the Scottish Government, which decimated services, increased risk factors for death and increased mortality rates during this time. And again, I keep on asking myself, is it a case of the deserving versus the undeserving? And although other statutory partner agencies are expected to increase the budget allocations, this has not always occurred, nor is it mandatory to do so. And again, in terms of budget budgets, what is also worth noting that the Scottish Government discretionary budget, that is the money that's available for them to spend, is less than 1% more in 2010 levels. Therefore, it is essential that funding levels for ADPs and local authorities are increased significantly, in line with 2010 levels and because of, of real-term equivalents. Again, I hear, I hear the term system change being used pretty frequently these days. However, I can only see mainly, mainly pharmacological responses to this ongoing public health crisis or increasing treatment options for people. Both are welcome. However, these responses, they don't tackle the main contributing factor for the death, social economic inequalities. Again, the actions taken forward, for me, they're no system change. They're actually tinkering around the edges of the system. Also, what I continue to ask, does the system want to change? The Rights Respect Recovery Strategy, the Appending Action Plan, all the actions taken forward by the Drug Death Task Force are welcome, and the Drug Death Task Force Forward Plan are welcome also, but they ignore the lack of accountability or a lack of adequate governance. Again, there are numerous occasions where over the past years, the funding's, funds no directed to deliver national priorities and poor outcomes are no always held to account. Again, Ian's talked about it and I'll talk about, uh, about the power imbalance. Power imbalance is start. Again, the report suggests in the, in the, 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 the Dundee Drug Commission that voluntary sector providers are too scared to raise concerns in case they lose funding. Furthermore, statutory providers are no way held to the same level of account as the voluntary sector providers, nor can they be decommissioned for poor performance or delivering poor outcomes. In terms of recommendation, I'd say going forward, it would be highly beneficial to have a separation between the purchaser and provider of services with a standalone commissioning body, and if possible, a regulatory body with statutory enforcement powers, as is in the case of other policy areas. And again, this could be simply enacted through a piece of legislation within the Scottish Parliament. In terms of commissioning cycles, I say they have to be longer. Back in 2017, the Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs suggested that it should be at least five to seven years or even seven to ten years. 
and it would allow organisations to concentrate and deliver on better outcomes. But again, for me, it's also staggering that even after several reviews of open replacement therapy, we still don't know how many people access methadone in Scotland. And also, it's worth noting that the former Chief Medical Officer commented in 2019 that it was surprised that this was still the case. Again, a recommendation going forward is essential that unit costs for treatment and also we know how many people access no patient replacement therapy is calculated so again we can effectively assess need, plan and deliver services. Secondly, what I see is the indisputable evidence that problematic substance use and drug deaths are area-based problems that require area-based solutions. Again, I spoke about it earlier on, 10 years on from the Christie Commission, and not enough progress has been made. A phrase coined back then was failure demand, basically doing the same things and expecting different results. Again, during the past decade, negative drug-related outcomes have driven significantly. A report published last week also suggests that mortality from drugs is the biggest contributor to socioeconomic inequalities and mortality among young men in Scotland. Likewise, a report published highlights the increased death amongst women, therefore challenging the ageing cohort narrative that has churned out and has been churned out over the past couple of years. Again, evident Ian, uh, even Ian uh, mentioned it earlier on, that evidence presented in our papers outlined, outlined that more than half of drug deaths are within deprived communities. And in some areas, the prevalence is as, heart, as bad as heart disease and strokes. Again, the former report concludes that to reduce deaths of despair, actions should be taken to address social determinants of health and reduce social economic inequalities. Again, look at Public Health Scotland, uh, the strategic plan recently, and also the modern evaluation framework for the National Drugs and Alcohol Strategy. And when reviewing both these documents, there is no mention that drug deaths or drug harms are disproportionately within deprived areas, despite evidence linking both. In, term, in fact, in terms of tackling inequalities at a local level, there actually are the existing structures in place. For instance, the Community Empowerment Act in 2015 put community planning partnerships in a statutory footing. Again, all partner agencies operating within the local area are responsible and accountable for delivering responses for tackling inequalities at a local level. Again, this progressive piece of legislation ensures that community planning partnerships develop locality plans, area-based plans for communities or communities of interest that experience higher levels of inequalities. Again, after reviewing all these locality plans, there are, although there are exceptions, generally there are scant specific actions related to drug harms or reducing drug deaths contained within the plans. It's imperative that these existing plans are revised and include actions and outcomes related to problematic substance use and resourced in accordance with the Fair of Scotland duty. At local level, I would say that better systems leadership is required at a local level. We have to work, we have to work shoulder to shoulder with communities interest of place and a transformational approach. Again, this is crucial as these areas already experience significant health inequalities that have disproportionately affected by COVID and will take longer to recover. And again, how we take this forward? Scottish Government have rolled out an approach where local government asked communities to decide on 1% of their revenue budget. Again, this is welcome. However, Scottish Government should work with local government and increase this amount significantly. And also, I would say it should suggest to go further and have all public sector organisations to adopt this. And again, this would enable communities to experience inequalities with adequate resources to design, develop and deliver area-based solutions for area-based problems. Again, as Ian touched on earlier on, the rights-based approach put forward by the Scottish Government is welcome. Again, it is critical that this approach is fully embedded across all levels of governance and communities are trained in this approach. Again, it's imperative as a modern and progressive society that advocates the importance of human rights. These rights are for all citizens, no, no the only ones that society deems deserving. We'll continue to be open-handed and inclusive. We'll continue to offer to work collaborative, no matter which political party, ag agency, statutory, non statutory we have to tackle this where it is. It's an uncomfortable truth. Thanks, folks. Thanks very much, Barry. Thank you. Um,
Next, we're going to hear from uh, Tracy McFall, who is the Chief Executive of Independent Advocacy. Tracy's worked across a range of uh, addictions uh, services in the voluntary sector for more than a decade and has advised the Scottish Government in a range of uh, policy areas. Tracy. Thanks Neil and, and you said that was only a decade there. Oh my god I wish it was. It's about 25 years and I'm probably showing my age by now as well. Listen thanks very much for organising this all of you. Thanks very much for asking me to contribute. Um, I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes not with a, a, a lot of um, potential problems, but maybe some more of the solutions in terms of what my experience has been. And Ian said something really important. He said this should really begin with giving people rights. I totally agree with that, but I would also add on that's that's my pup in the background. Excuse me, sorry, would you say? Come on. Come on. Sorry folks, working from home is never easy. Um, so just as Ian said there around, we need to start from a place about giving people rights and I, I totally agree with that, but I think there's another layer that I'm going to add to that. And I think as leaders, all of us, no matter where you are in the system, no matter what your place is in terms of how you support people, we need to start having different conversations. We need to come together and disagree and have a bit of a rant and a rave but in the middle, hopefully we can find some of the solutions. And I work building relationships with folk. So my practice is based on trust, honesty, openness, respect. And I think we need to, as leaders, mirror and model that right across the piece. So that's just a caveat for me. I think we've all got responsibility to lead, um, to lead the sector. So just quickly, I've got four points, four broad points to make. So if you think about the structure in Scotland, the structure in Scotland has changed significantly um, over a number of years from ADPs to IGBs. Um, and what we knew as a sector, from my perspective, is actually we were starting to see some problems emerging with the system before COVID. But what COVID has taught me in terms of the sector and the relationships that I have with a range of uh, local authorities across the country is um, it, it's starting to potentially tweak and um, it's starting to kind of expand the parts of the system that were already creaking. So whilst we have got national and local structures, I absolutely get that. I think there is a, an issue for me around one accountability in relation to, okay, we've got a range of these structures in place, but actually are we using them? And in speaking to Barry, we were having a chat about this and I've probably read every integrated joint plan in the country. And every single integrated joint plan will say that there is a participation approach, there is consultation with local communities to build, to develop, and to really enhance the services that local communities need. I've not seen that come through yet, really, in a lot of areas that I work, and I think that is down to an element of, of accountability and where the, I suppose, the, the duty bearers sit in that process. Um, Post-COVID, there is a massive opportunity for me. I'm, I, I sit across a number of national groups and we are having the exact same discussion in the justice agenda. We're having the exact same discussion in homelessness. We're having the exact same discussion in mental health and actually a large proportion of the most vulnerable groups, and we know this from hard edges, they will be bounced around a number of those systems and we know that. So can we have a conversation? and even I'd explore a conversation about how we can really do things differently in Scotland, because let's face it, there's no big magic money tree, and all of us that work in the sector know there's no big magic money tree, but we need to do it differently with what we've got as a starter. In terms of the third sector, I'm not going to... The um, Economic Recovery Group said that the third sector was actually played a crucial part in COVID and will continue to play a part. The Equality and Human Rights uh, pre-budget scrutiny report and, and later to the First, uh, first Minister and Government said the same thing. The third sector, this cannot be done without the third sector in all ways, shapes and form. And things can be done differently in Scotland because when COVID first hit, there was a range of funds that were set up that had very little bureaucracy and that money went straight to the communities that needed it. So this can be done. If the will is there and the money needs to get to where it is, this can be done with very little bureaucracy, but still governance. And that's proved that to me that this can be done really, really quickly. 
So in terms of the value and contribution is, and I'm going to say this, I've worked for the, the third sector my whole life, I've, I've worked in social care my whole life, and actually what COVID has taught me is it's not just about third sector providers. What I've seen is local communities rise up to support each other. And that's something that has always happened, but we've never really seen that before. So I think communities are at a real place where they want to see things change and they want to have a voice. Um, I'll not be surprised, any surprise for that I have, a, I have a, a challenge with the power dynamic in the country, <laughs> whether that be communities and um, people who live in the communities, whether it's about statutory services, voluntary sector, whether it's about people who want their rights upheld and a system that's saying, no, you don't fit with us. There is a power dynamic that we really need to start discussing in Scotland. Um, and I think that was acknowledged and evident before COVID. COVID has really started to focus on that for me across the sector. And that's about potentially what people say, but their behaviour is different in relation to commissioning, etc. Yeah, the voice of lived experience will be at the centre. Yes, the voice of communities will be at the centre. Is it? Is it really at the centre of things? And that's where accountability comes in. Now, relationships are very important to me. Um, I build my day-to-day -day work in relationships, and ultimately that's why we're all here. We need to build relationships across different, a, a range of different conversations. And then finally, the last thing I want to say, and I don't want to take up too much more time, is there is a massive opportunity here, folks. And I know people might say, Tracy, you've been a bit naive. <sighs> Maybe I'm just trying to be positive, but there's a massive opportunity here with what we are having to see in Scotland. Currently, pre-COVID, we're already seeing the default position about local authorities reducing third sector and doing everything in-house. One, that costs more. Two, it's more. Two, it's less flexible. And actually, over time, it'll probably come back out to the third sector. Um, so there is a range of different discussions that we really need to have. We'll get hard edges. We'll get the stuff that Ian and Barry have done. We'll get the work of the drug-related guest task force. We'll get justice recovery going on. We've got all the work that we've done around mental health and homelessness. So my worry is that we're going to default position back into our re-silos. We've done it, we've done the early release, everybody came together, they've done the early release, they've got people off the street into hotels. The next stage for me is, can we keep that learning and no default back into our silos where we're feeling very comfortable and we don't, because it, it can work, it absolutely can work. And I suppose lastly for me, is, um, and I suppose this is a plea to, to Scottish Government, is we know the complexities that we're working with and uh, across communities. We know there's an opportunity to do things differently. We know there's a um, huge amount of money being spent in addictions over the last number of years, but actually we're having a conversation about how, the, how this money can come together. Have we thought about, if we looked at human, human, um, human rights-based budgeting, what that would mean for Scotland? And I know Scotland, I know the Scottish Government are starting to look at that. Um, so I would just ask all of you just to Start having those open up conversations, and I suppose I can only take responsibility for myself as a leader in Scotland, but I would urge all of us to just open up, take the challenge, listen, and open up that dialogue. That's all I'm going to say, Neil. Thanks, folks. Thanks very much, Tracy. That's excellent, and welcome to your dog to the meeting. Um, I uh, can now uh, ask Fiona Gilbertson from Recovery Justice to, to speak. Fiona has had 25 years of advocacy, advocacy experience, uh, policy development and lobbying experience. And uh, Fiona uh, believes very much that a fundam way, fundamental way to tackle stigma and discrimination is through policy change. So over to you, Fiona. Well, I didn't know I was next. <laughs> <laughs> I just nipped out the room. Do you know what? I've written something and I'm going to read it. Um, so, because I'm really angry and I'm really emotional <laughs> and it isn't about me. So my name's Fiona Gilbertson, I'm from Recovering Justice. Uh, we're an organisation founded by people whose lives have been impacted by policy through our drug use. We look for peaceful solutions to the war on drugs, which is focused through the Misuse of Drugs Act in the UK and enacted by our criminal justice system and social services. And I think we always, I'm going to read this quote. The policies that we're working from, I just want to remind everybody, come from a failed war on drugs that Nixon started. And one of his advisors came out and said, why the war on drug users? 
You want to know what this was really all about. Nixon had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalising both heavily, we could disrupt our communities. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So what we're talking about is a failed policy that was used to disrupt the peace movement and was fundamentally ra racist. And that's still what we're working on. So I think we always need to remind ourselves of that. So why did I do this? I was infected with HIV in Edinburgh in 1984 through IV drug use. Edinburgh came, became known as the AIDS capital of Europe. 35 years later, we're all still here. And we're now the drugs death capital of the world. And we've just seen an outbreak, an ongoing outbreak amongst people using drugs who have no homes in Glasgow. This is a war enact, enacted on our poorest. The population we're discussing today are experienced challenges which have been exhaustively mapped and documented, as has been said earlier, on an individual level. Problematic substance use, trauma, criminalisation. I'm fed up of hearing where people have come from because I believe the greatest challenge they face is structural violence. The policies embedded in the political and economic fabric of our society are inherently violent as they cause injury to people. In this instance, HIV and other, other infections and the drug deaths or drug poisonings that we're seeing today. Marginalised populations have no space, safe space to go and ingest their choosing, chosen substances because our outdated drug laws have made some substances legal and others not, based not on science but arbitrary and outdated laws taken from a US policy steeped in racism. My interest as an activist is to challenge and change the structural forces that have created an, an environment for an, an outbreak to occur. I haven't used IV drug, used drugs for decades. I look back at my 20 year old self, I needed heroin assisted treatment, a safe place to live, I work as a sex worker to not be criminalised and to not be worrying about dodging either police or drug related violence. My community died of preventable disease and they're still dying today as we still talk. We believe we need to decriminalise drug use, regulate all drugs, decriminalising some and regulating others and set up extensive heroin assisted treatment programmes and safer consumption spaces and decriminalise all aspects of sex work. Will this stop problematic substance use? Of course not, but it will keep people alive. It will keep them within their families and communities. It will keep them out of prison cells and hospital beds. Taking the structural foot off the neck of people who use drugs will allow them to breathe and will give them space to get into whatever recovery looks like for them. Scotland has the opportunity to be visionary. We're a small country and we've heard a lot of solutions today. And I also keep hearing this like there's no magic money tree. It's not true. If we took the money from organised crime and the criminal justice system, <laughs> do you know, I don't even know but some of you guys here know, the money that's been spent on people who use drugs is phenomenal. If we devolved, and I'm going to talk about some of the more aspirational ones, if we devolved powers from Westminster, we could create a fair trade cannabis market and ring fence the money to be spent on education and treatment. They did it in Uruguay, they did it in Canada, not perfectly, a lot of the states have got it wrong, but we have smart enough people in Scotland to work out what that would look like for us. A regulated fair trade cannabis market would deprive organised crime of money and power while raising tax revenue for treatment and prevention. We could adopt our own decriminalisation policy informed by Portugal, not replicating it, but informed. They were facing similar problems to Portugal 
they were facing similar problems to Scotland, not as bad. I mean, we're now, as we know, the drugs death capital of the world. But they chose to decriminalise drug possession, people who use drugs and treat it as a health and human rights issue. So drug policy reform for Scotland is not about drugs. I think we need to stop talking about drugs. In it's about human rights. It's about choosing evidence over stigma, choosing life over death and disease choosing to stop having conversations where we focus on individuals and their behaviours and have the courage to challenge and lobby against the structural violence and inequality at the heart of drug policy. I really hope I'm not here next year. I really hope that I can put my whole organisation out of business in the next three or four years. I don't know what to say. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. That was absolutely tremendous. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was superb. And uh, I'm so pleased that you contributed today because um, I, I think, certainly for me, um, I could have sat and listened to you for much longer than that. I think what you're speaking is very much uh, truth uh, uh, in relation to what is actually going on in communities and um, the, the difference, the rhetoric that we hear over the reality of some of what you've just said there is very powerful and it certainly reflects my experience in working in my community. So thanks very much for that. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Aidan Martin. Aidan is uh, Aidan's one of my constituents. He is a, um, a lived experience author who just uh, wrote a book, Euphor Euphoric Recall, which is um, his um, life story and his journey through uh, recovery and trauma and addiction and uh, Aidan works uh, in mental health advocacy with uh, people going through uh, people who are drug users so uh, over to you Aidan. Thank you Neil it's good to see everybody um, and thanks to all the other speakers that I've, I've spoken before it's been very interesting to listen to everyone I think you know I'm, I'm not a heavyweight as far as the politics like the people that have come before me are probably much more informed than I am about politics but I do work in the field and I have got lived experience and I think what I want to highlight is my story is a rare one. I'm 34 and I'm a male that grew up in a place called Ladywell in Livingston, very working class and to even be doing uni or writing a book, stuff like that, it shouldn't be happening for me. And the reason I'm saying that is of all the friends I grew up with and Forgive me for referring to males a lot, I'm not trying to make it gender specific, but I'm just talking about my own experience and of all the, the male friends I grew up with, only one of us didn't turn out to be an addict. Only one of us went on a different path and he ended up being a police officer. Uh, the rest of us ended up in, in institutions, uh, in violence and stuck in addiction and severe mental health and my friends from my childhood are still in that situation. A lot of the people I had problems with, the lads I had issues with, enemies back in the day, but you know, we didn't know what kind of lifestyle we were a part of. A lot of them are just coming out of prison or they've died of overdoses, that kind of stuff. Um, it was rife, it was rife. And there was a lot of different factors for that. And these things have been covered by the, the previous speakers, but one of the main ones for me was the high school I went to wasn't fit for purpose. There was no education, we were all sent out the door at 15, 16 and told to just get on with it and most of us had no idea who we were, there was no identity, there was no aspirations, there was no hope. We came from an area where there was a lot of violence and people didn't have a lot and I thought I was daft. I left school thinking I was daft and then there was no real, no looking back I can see there was no career opportunities, there was no opportunities to become an anybody. Um, the people sort of ask, you know, why would someone end up in addiction? My question wouldn't be that. My question would be, why wouldn't they end up in addiction? Why wouldn't they end up in a substance abuse lifestyle if you've got no hope and no belief and no aspirations? And a lot of people that I grew up with have gone through trauma. And I won't go into the graphic details of my trauma, but I went through a severe trauma, which was intertwined with my addiction. And for a lot of years, I didn't know where to go for help. And I ended up going to a third sector organization for support. And that happened because someone tried to kill me. And the person that tried to kill me just came out of jail now and we're talking. And he grew up with drug dealers and his family and it was all he knew. And 
Anyway, so my journey was then a third sector organization helped me and they directed me to mutual aid fellowships. And it was a mutual aid fellowship where I started to discover that, okay, I wasn't a horrible, disgusting human being. I made bad life choices. I made some poor decisions, but actually there was a lot of reasons behind that. Um, and then I started to volunteer. And then I went to college in my mid-20s. And in my mid-20s, I finally discovered I wasn't daft and I wasn't morally inferior. And I started to learn about society and that there was a lot of broken systems and broken structures that were preceding even me. You know, my biological father lived and died in addiction. He didn't even know he was an addict. So I started to learn there was all, all these reasons why I'd ended up the way I did. And you know, I almost killed myself a lot of times. That would have went down as a suicide statistic, but it would have been a drugs death one. It would have been because of drug use and addiction, but it wouldn't have been in those statistics. It would have been suicide. And now, fast forward all these years later, I've gone and got a degree and I've done good things in my life because at, at West Lovian College, I was told that I could have a future. You know, I was made to believe that I could become someone. And, and I think all these lads I grew up with, talented human beings, good human beings, good people, and most of them are still stuck. And a lot of them are suicidal. And it's like, they didn't get a fair chance. And things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. And, you know, I, I believe we've got issues with the Misuse of Drugs Act and, and all that stuff with Westman. So that's, I don't even need to debate that. I think everyone here probably understands that. But I'm extremely frustrated with my own government as well because I feel like they're silent. I feel like nothing's getting said, not enough's getting said. I feel like we've got a crisis going on. And as someone that both works in the field and has lived and survived through it, I'm, I'm like, what's happening? What's actually going to be done? And I'm not naming names of politicians or anything like that but i have tried privately and publicly to get people to notice what's going on both again as a worker and through lived experience and it's only since i had the book come out a couple of months ago that i'm actually being taken seriously now whereas before my voice didn't matter it's only that i'm an author I'm, i've got a book that the voice matters now whereas before nobody was hearing me nobody was hearing what i was saying i'm an advocacy worker through here in west Albion too and you know my job is to advocate on behalf of people that identify as having a substance abuse problem we don't label it as addiction or alcoholism we just let people come to their own decision about what they see it as I can hand on heart tell you that in the almost two years i've done the job people in west Lovian don't know where to go for support since the book came out i've had so many people from my area contact me personally because they feel like they can identify with what i've said and they're asking me, and this is just West Lobin, they're asking me, where can I go? Where can my partner go for support? What can I do about my son with his addiction, etc., etc.? And my honest answer is, I don't know. I feel like we're overly reliant on third sector organizations that get cuts all the time. And we're overly reliant on the mutual aid meetings, you know, recovering addicts or alcoholics or whatever people want to call it. And I also believe that recovery means lots of different things. It doesn't just mean abstinence it can mean harm reduction it can mean a whole range of different things but my personal experience has been going to a mutual aid meeting and becoming abstinent and that's what worked for me personally and it's the only answer i seem to have for people is mutual aid meetings it's all i know you know there's there's just it feels like there's a real lack of places that i can tell people to go i don't have the answers for them and people are dying in record numbers now and i just look at all the lads i grew up with I think about my biological father, I think how genera generational it's been historical and somehow it's getting even worse. It's getting, the numbers are showing that it's getting worse. And it's taken me to be in my mid-30s to start realising my potential that I should have started realising 20 years ago. I'm playing catch-up for 20 years ago when I, I should have started to realise this potential the way back then. Uh, and I look at, like I say, all these people I grew up with and I just think they're lost souls, so many of them. And we we're talking about the the age cohort. Again, I'm talking from personal experience, from being in the recovery scene. They're coming in the door younger and younger. And it's not just stereotypical addiction problems now. It's all kinds of uppers, cocaine, whether it's injecting or snorting. The folk are coming in the doors of recovery and, and trying to get well at 19 and 20. That's probably two-pronged. That It's probably because more people know there's recovery meetings. But it's also because addictions harming more than just an so-called older generation it's widespread it's rife it's everywhere um 
and you know it's, it's it's intertwined with mental health and suicide and there'll be so many people that kill themselves out of sheer desperation and that will not be included in these figures because it'll go down as a suicide and my death would have been a suicide and I was saved because of recovery fellowship and yes yeah, I feel so frustrated in society right now and it's what inspired me to to write a book and put my own stuff out and there's, there's so many facets to it, trauma you know lack of getting you know, I'm only just getting a house next year as well so I'm just getting on the housing market in my mid 30s getting a chance to a career should never happen from where I came from and the jobs I've done since I've graduated I've worked for some fantastic third sector organizations but they always feel understaffed and overwhelmed and really long waiting lists for services and then a frustration for me is I've gone from small contract to small contract, small as in a short period of time, and always feel like I can't do anything that's long lasting. And that's why I've gone back to do a social work master's degree. Uh, I'm not even sure if I'm going to go down that path or not. And in all honesty, we this is I'll kind of finish on saying this. I feel like I've made more difference in the last six weeks since I released my book than I've managed to do in years of working in different organizations and that's not because I've not tried I've tried my hardest and I've worked for some fantastic organizations who have got the greatest will in the world to make a massive difference but we're getting overwhelmed because the problem is massive and something needs to be done so I'm, I'm privileged to be asked to come along I hope my little bit has been worthwhile thank you thanks very much Aidan that was excellent. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Um, we've posted in the chat box the Aidan's books called Euphoric Recall. I would thoroughly recommend that. It's, uh, it's, it's a very um, uh, stark and, and very um, a very personal account of Aidan's experience, but very much worth reading and sharing with people. Um, somebody was asking also if we will uh, where we'll be posting this afterwards i think it'll probably be posted via my facebook page and ian and barry's facebook pages but i'll need to speak to barry and see if he's got one and ian if they've got one so we'll we'll, we'll let you know before the end where we'll post this because it's we want to get it out to the widest possible audience for people who couldn't uh, make it um okay next up we have uh peter kreiker uh peter is a lived experienced citizen who's challenging the premise of the misuse of drugs act as we speak uh, with his um, uh, safe injection facility within the city centre of Glasgow uh, over the last six months Peter's done some sterling work fantastic work and um, uh, people will have seen in the media that he has attracted the attention of the criminal justice system because uh, his crime has been to try and prevent people dying, which is an absolutely outrageous situation that we're in. Um, but people, P Peter will uh, tell us about that himself. It's over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, Neil. And, uh, <clears throat> thanks for uh, and the panelists and everybody that's Paul and Barry and Ian, you know, all about the, the sort of, you know, the, the statistics and the data and the analysis and all the academic stuff. But then listening to Fiona and, and Aidan really put me at ease there because, you know, the title of this is they're, they're only junkies who cares if they die, you know, and let's get it right. All I am is a two bob bit junkie for fuck up. You know, that's all I am. And, uh, you know, I've took it upon myself to, to go out and try and do something that's been getting talked and talked about in Scotland for years now. Um, so, yeah, I uh, got involved in doing this type of stuff. I, you know, my story is similar to Aidan, you know, like I went to school, everybody that I grew up with got involved in drugs. You know, by the age of 11, I was a, I was a daily drug user. By the age of 17, I was injecting heroin. And by the age of 20, I was living rough on the streets of Birmingham, injecting heroin and crack cocaine on a daily basis. You know, thankfully, I, I found a, a way out and my life changed. And I... You know, I got married, had kids, and then got a job in sales. And then a few years ago, after being a stay-at-home dad for a year, I thought I can use my own experience to go out and help others. So I got a job working in a, in a recovery community. And, uh, you know, that opened, opened my eyes up to the lack of support and the lack of help for people. You know, people would often come to the recovery cafes or the events, and if they were out, if they were out they're not, if they were mad with it, they'd be turned away. 
you know, they'd be told that you're mad with it, you're out, you're not, you need to come back when you're a wee bit, wee bit less out, you're not sort of thing, um, because it would be putting the people who were stable or a, or in abstinence-based recovery at risk if they were to be there. And, uh, you know, that really opened my eyes, you know, I, I, uh, I, feel, I feel emotional and upset and sad that I would turn anybody away who was in a desperate situation needing help. Um, but that was my job, so that's what I was paid to do. Um, but after a very short time, my last job was an HIV out street outreach worker testing homeless people who are injecting drugs in Glasgow City Centre, rapid testing for HIV. And I would and I'd done that for a few months and I would walk away from them knowing that they were going to be back at risk that same day. They'd be back in the alleyways that I was injecting drugs in twenty odd years ago. You know, what's the point in providing an HIV test to somebody who you know that's going to be back in a rat infested alleyway the next that night injecting drugs again at risk of blood borne viruses? You know, at risk of dying in these horrible squalid conditions. Um, so, you know, I just was, I was sick and tired of this political football getting kicked about between Holyrood and Westminster and all this, you know, stuff that was going on in terms of, you know, whether we have the right responses or not. So I went to Copenhagen and I was lucky enough to meet Nana and uh, Michael Lundberg, who started the original facility over there. And I looked at the experiences of Denmark, I looked at the experiences of places like Canada, where these facilities have been set up through activism. And uh, I just decided to go ahead and do it. I attended the Drug Desk, Drug Desk Summit on the 27th of February. And Aidan Al will mention, mention the politicians at that Drug Desk Summit and throughout the mantra from Joe Fitzpatrick, has been, if only we had drug consumption facilities, if only the Mistress of Drugs Act was de devolved, complete and utter farce. What's happening here in Scotland is, is within our control. We have the same legislation to work from as the UK government have, but, but yet we have a three times, more than three times higher drug death rate than Scotland. It's a complete farce. Even our prescribing services are a complete farce. If I go to Change Grow Live for a prescription in, in Birmingham, Change Grow Live and assess me and get me on a prescription. If I go to Change Grow Live here in Edinburgh, they can't even prescribe because they don't employ prescribing prescribers. They have to assess me and then I have to be sent to the NHS for another assessment. If I'm, a, if I'm running about the streets trying to get enough money together for a bag of heroin and a bag of cocaine to inject in my groin, there is no way that I'm going to be making multiple assessments just to get onto a prescription. I'm like, I'm not bothered about that, I'm bothered about my next hit. That's the simple reality of it. So our system's completely broken from the inside out. You've got all these third sector organisations who are funded by the government. The government, the Scottish government spread the funding so thin and it's it's incorrect. They, they, they spread the funding so thin across all these third sector organisations that none of them are, are actually willing or have got the balls to stand up and say what's actually wrong with the system in the first place. It's completely and utterly broken. It's no wonder that our drug death rate is as high as it is. In terms of the actual facility that I run, We've, we've now supervised 100 injections, 100 times that we've we, we, we've kept people safe, 100 times that if somebody had overdosed, they would have been kept alive, 100 times that we've stopped the risk of bloodborne tr transmissions. And Fiona spoke about it. You know, we're currently in the midst of an HIV outbreak, an e epidemic that the UK has not witnessed in 30 years. Over 190 cases in, in Glasgow City Centre are ongoing. Um, and the Scottish Government have got no, they've got just no answer, they've got no willingness to step up and challenge constitutional boundaries. It's became clear and apparent that we have the ability to set up a drug consumption facility or a safer injecting facility, because it's not, not even actually illegal under the Mistress of Drugs Act 1971. The only, the only illegal aspect is people coming to the facility with the simple possession of the drugs because it's not covered under the Act. It talks about, I mean, it's so outdated, and yes, it would be great if it would, was devolved and we could just change it ourselves, but it's so outdated. It talks about preparing opium to be smoked and cannabis to be smoked, and that's why cannabis clubs have consistently been shut down throughout the United Kingdom throughout the last 40 years or however long that the, the, the people have been trying to run them. 
So yeah, I, I, I get frustrated. You can probably hear that the, 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 there is anger in my voice because you know that the, the fact that is that I've been out, there's been a, a few years out doing this, another person on this call, we've been out there doing it every single week. Yet we cannot get the support of the, drug, the, the Scottish Drugs Death Task Force, as an example, have completely ignored us. You know, the third sector organisations, recovery organisations, they haven't really got behind it. You know, like, what, we, what we want to do is we want to keep people alive so that they can get a chance to get into recovery, so they, they can get a chance to stay, with, like, if you want to say it again, you know, a chance to be with their families, you know, at Christmas. I mean, we're going to hear for 10 days before Christmas about thousands of people dying again in Scotland. And it's absolutely, it's absolutely despicable um, that, that, that this is happening. It's, it's outrageous. Um, I don't know how long I've been talking for, but anyway, as you can see, probably tell, um, I'm a little bit pissed and I'm a little bit angry about 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 the whole situation, to be honest. Because in, in, in the three small years that I've been involved in this stuff, I mean, I am not an academic, and I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not like anything at all like that. I got kicked out of school when I was 14, um, but like from a, a layman's terms, from somebody that, that's a complete layman, I can see that the, there's clear cut solutions that we can introduce, like low threshold prescribing. People should not, I was working with a guy through lockdown, I'll finish up on this, I was working with a guy through lockdown who, who stays in my local town, he, he lives in Falkirk and he was outside Tesco's begging every day for spare change. Now, I went to the third, the third sector organisation with this guy and says, can this guy get assess, assessed to get on a prescription? And they were like, no, he's no high risk enough because he's no injecting, he's no injecting heroin, he's only smoking heroin. The guy couldn't even get an assessment until I went and spoke to Chris Clements and got him on BBC The Night. As soon as he's on BBC TV, he gets assessed and he's on a prescription within a week. You know, it's like, but before that, they were like, no, no, we can't get him assessed. Because he's no, he's no at, at high enough risk. A previous injector I've got a mixture of street benzodiazepine use, um, uh, smoking heroin on a daily basis. I mean, we've got that's the, that's one of the frustrating things about running the overdose prevention centre in, in Glasgow. We don't have anywhere to send anybody. What do you do? Where do you send somebody when they're when they're on 120 mils of methadone and they're injecting cocaine and they're growing ten times a day? Like, what what, what do you do? I go and chap on the door of the drug crisis centre. We're working with a 20 year old. She comes to see us every week. She's got the, the, the deepest self harm scars that I've ever witnessed up and down both arms. She's sleeping in a tent outside the Glasgow Ser Sheriff Court and she's injecting heroin in her brain every day. It's fucking outrageous. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> That's me. I'm done. Peter, thanks very much for that. Um, again, uh, what we're hearing from Peter is the reality over the rhetoric and I think it's it's absolutely critical that we hear from people like that. I think Peter, um, I, I'm only speaking personally, you know, you're one of my heroes at the moment because you, the only thing that you're doing is trying to save lives. The only thing you're trying to do is save lives and yet you are being subjected to the criminal justice system when there is no need for that to happen in Scotland, none whatsoever. And uh, I, from um, dealing with constituents who come to us uh, or, or have come to us over the years with um, mental health uh, problems, which we are seeing far more people come to us and people who are more acutely unwell coming to us, many of them involved with addiction of some kind. We can't find them anywhere to go either. We're trying to kick the door down to the health service or the agencies there is nowhere, particularly for people who are involved with cocaine, that appears to be an area where there's just a complete absence of any support whatsoever, unless, as Aidan said, it's some of the mutual help organisations. Um, our last speaker is uh, Darren McGarvey, uh, who is a, um, an award-winning author. Um, many of you, I hope, will have read Darren's book, Poverty Safari. He's a journalist and musician and TV presenter and um, regular columnists in newspapers and has uh, recently um, been on BBC Scotland presenting uh, his uh, Darren McGarvey Scotland. Um, so over to you Darren. Thanks Neil. <clears throat> Hello everyone, thank you very much to all the contributors so far. 
uh, much to think about and also commend anyone else who's given up their time to come in here uh, and possibly be challenged by some of the things uh, that have been said. Uh, for anyone who follows me, you will not be surprised to learn that I believe at the very core of this is a simple matter of, of social class. Um, uh, as a public figure in Scotland, it's a very lonely and isolating uh, place that I occupy uh, where consistently, despite the fact I'm fed up talking about class, I have to consistently raise it in interviews, newspapers, uh, basically channeling my thoughts and feelings on social class through every station that is on and find increasingly that I'm one of the only people in the pub, regularly in the public eye who still invokes that language of class conflict, uh, which partly because of the gentrification of language in the age of social mobility and poverty of aspiration and meritocracy, uh, it, 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 it means that we, we don't have the language often to describe some of the ulterior dynamics at play here. So I want to try and outline for you in as terse a manner as possible uh, some of the evidence that I believe reveals that uh, the people in charge misunderstand the issue on a couple of fundamental levels, but that it's increasingly difficult to challenge that because of the class structures which uh, not only uh, inoculate them from accountability, but also because they speak in a certain language and present themselves in a certain way that conforms to a specific studied informality, which means that the general public tends to believe what they say over what people with lived experience say, those who bear the scars of addiction, who present socially in an entirely different manner, which is deemed less trustworthy, less sophisticated and less knowledgeable. So Scotland has a proud pioneer in history. We brought the world antibiotics, telecommunications, paradigm shift and enlightenment. Uh, but we also lead the way in delusional hubris uh, and finger pointing. In Scotland, our successes are our own, but our, our failures, and there are many, are usually somebody else's fault. And by far the greatest blemish on our storied history in recent times is the collective abandonment of the most vulnerable, persecuted and excluded group in our society, drug addicts. Data published uh, last year revealed, obviously, that in Scotland drug deaths rose by 27% to 1,187. So that, that meant that the, the drug death toll in Scotland was the equivalent to five Lockerbie bombings or 57 seven terrorist attacks. Uh, nearly three times that of the UK as a whole and per capita, the drug death rate in Scotland is higher than that of the United States. But this language of national emergency is yet to be invoked. Conversely, in 1996, an E. coli outbreak, which affected 200 people and caused 21 deaths, led to a public inquiry, which produced a damning report placing blame on a wish or butcher and council health officials. But in 2019, when tens of thousands were hooked on drugs and over a thousand died, uh, there wasn't that same hunger for accountability. So we have to ask ourselves, why is there such a premium on some lives and some emergencies and such a lack uh, of premium on others. In Scotland, the drug problem is out of control, to be quite frank. Uh, I think of it like a fire that leaps from one structure to another, that takes on a life of its own. It's now self-sustaining, it's independent of the conditions that have caused it. Uh, and the cause seems to baffle many. Obviously, there are various theories out there it could be attributable to so many different things. Uh, one of the main ones I would contend, uh, the sharp managed decline of the industries around which went many working class communities formerly cohered. Uh, the mechanisms by which they once lifted themselves out of poverty were sacrificed on the altar of the free market and replaced with Frankie and Benny's and American style shopping malls and chippies and bookies and casinos and in Dundee, the drug death capital, a world leading design museum partly funded by the billionaires implicated in the US opioid crisis. Drug related deaths like untreated disease and violence beget drug related deaths. It's much like a flower that drops seeds before it wilts. Those who perish in such sordid, undignified and often terrifying ways don't serve as warnings to others. Instead, they become martyrs of sorts. They are mourned 
not just by their families, but by those with whom they sought and used the drugs that killed them. And this is something that must be understood. When you're dealing with people who manage difficult emotions with drugs, when their community is facing death on an industrial scale, that is going to drive up the amounts that people use, how often they seek out the drugs, which creates more demand in the supply chain, and then this problem just begins to feed itself. Opiates like heroin, methadone and morphine are, are commonly implicated, but by far the most consequential development in recent years has been the rise of counterfeit versions of prescription benzodiazepines, uh, the street valium, as well as, as cheap and deadly imitations of popular American anti-anxiety drugs, Xanax. So a compounding factor is the panic that grips these communities of drug users who can't go a day or two without hearing another story about someone who has died. Uh, now, while I commend certain journalists uh, for the way that this is covered, the general spread in mainstream media, with a few notable exceptions, uh, is, is pretty dire. So drug users are invariably portrayed as vulgar, selfish, feckless individuals whose problems are self-generated. The notion that they may actually care about each other and indeed take care of one another has thus far eluded public conscience. But drug takers survive by moving in tight-knit communities, bonded by the acute and constant social exclusion they endure. Every time one addict is found dead, the others grieve. They sense too that they might be next. They feel that society has all but abandoned them. Socially excluded, bastardised by the public and misunderstood by many who wish to help them. What is there to live for? And so they do what we all do when terrible things happen. They reach for whatever numbs the pain. And so the fire spreads, tearing through entire families and communities, leaving death and despair and dysfunction in its wake. Research published by Scottish universities in 2018 found that 18% of the Scottish population was prescribed at least one opioid painkiller in 2012. And that, quote, there were four times more prescriptions for strong opioids dispensed to people in the most deprived areas than to those in the most affluent areas. Every bit of data available points to a large increase in the prescription of addictive painkillers like cocodamol, tramadol over the last 10 years in the very communities where people are dying. The drug crisis may be framed as an issue about dangerous cocktails of counterfeit drugs, but many of the illegal substances on the market, the ones linked most often to the drug deaths, are simply amateur attempts to mimic the effects of state-approved substances which were either withdrawn or restricted once the addictions were done. Also, people who become dependent on pain pills uh, might switch to heroin because it's less expensive. In 2016, the National Institute uh, now, there are parallels with America, and so some of the American research is important. In 2016, the National Institute on Drug Abuse in America estimated that nearly half of young people who inject heroin turn to the street drug after abusing prescription painkillers. The fake drugs are dangerous because nobody is sure what's in them. State-approved drugs are dangerous because when over-prescribed, they increase the likelihood of addiction and tolerance. Therefore, the demand for drugs rises, including the fake ones. So while America is now doing something about this, uh, what are we doing in Scotland? Well, the government uh, last year, until obviously there was a bit of a public outcry, had cut funding for alcohol and drug partnerships by 6.3% since 2014-15. Uh, which brings me to the final point. Uh, the risk of addiction rises in areas of deprivation for a multitude of reasons. There's an interplay between the prescription of drugs for health problems, which predominantly affect people from poorer backgrounds, and the subsequent uptake of addictions. This is as true of treatment for physical pain as it is for anxiety and depression. It's also commonplace for people to take drugs that were not actually for them. Now, this is another thing. Because you, you're going to, you know, the, these are issues, subtle issues that don't often get addressed. We've got communities that are awash with drugs and addictions that have come as a direct consequence of uh, people who don't understand addiction uh, prescribing them and these drugs being diffused through chemists and health boards. Analysis by the BBC suggests around 2.3 million people in England took a prescription painkiller that was not prescribed to them in 2016-17. Uh, so we, we can be sure that we're not quite got a grip on exactly the various ways that people might become addicted. 
the drug problems uh, for me actually started when my gran gave me a painkiller to help me sleep when I was a teenager. Within weeks, I was dipping into the medicine cabinet. In poorer communities, ill health is more commonplace, increasing both the likelihood of treatment and the risk that a patient or someone in the household taking the drugs might become dependent. Society is awash with psychoactive substances in an age of chronic emotional and psychological stress. Increasing numbers are turning to drugs designed to treat chronic physical pain and mental health problems to self-medicate emotional pain, stress and the anxiety of poverty and social alienation. Put simply, without serious action on social inequality, drug-related death and despair are inevitable. If we want to make a serious impact on this matter, we must be prepared to analyse the environments in which addictive behaviours are likely to emerge. For some, the social conditions are so miserable, the addiction so severe, and the range of options available so few, that injecting a dirty needle into a groin despite already having had a leg amputated begins to seem like a reasonable solution. When that is your threshold for pain, popping a few tablets is merely a formality. The, the issue for me when it comes to the class dynamics here is that the area that we grow up in really kind of shapes many things about us. Things that we understand, like our educational attainment, how long we'll live, how educated we'll be, how much we'll earn. But there's a kind of ulterior dimension to this as well. So there are significant areas of divergence culturally and politically, and these create different sensibilities around language emotional attitude, sense of priority, accent, physical appearance. The problem we have in Scotland is that the people who understand how to get sober are the people who do not fit neatly into the world of civic Scotland studied informality. What we're dealing with here is a human rights issue and if you look into the history of human rights, you'll find that they are not won by moral arguments or calm appeals to reason. They're not won by working within traditional structures. They are not won by being polite or calming down. They are won when the people in charge understand, and they understand very deeply, that it will cost them more not to take action than to concede that they are wrong. And so we have to become prepared and willing to escalate this to another level because it's very, very clear to me that trying to work within the structures and trying to mimic and adopt the studied informalities that you require in order to uh, negotiate entry into the communities where decisions are made is not working out very well. You're getting wheeled out at conferences to talk about your drug experiences and then you're getting papped in the background again. When you get angry, they dismiss you. When you say there's no help available, they pull you up for your language on Twitter. So this is no longer acceptable to me. This is no longer acceptable to me. Um, I commend everybody, as I said before, for uh, their passion, their insight, the various different bits of research that are, are, have been made available. Uh, and as, but as important as all of that is, there has to be a willingness on behalf of all of us to make sacrifices whether that be our standing in certain communities, our sense of professional prestige, which is contingent on not speaking the truth, uh, we have to become willing to do what people in the trade union movement do. We have to become willing to do what people in the LGBT movement do. The people in, uh, the people in BAME communities have done. What women have done. Because if we're talking about human rights, then we're not going to get it by negotiating around a table in a nice, calm, friendly manner, unfortunately. Uh, I'll just leave it there and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Darren. That was excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned the fact that you're one of the few commentators who is willing to raise class issues. I find myself in the same boat in the Scottish Parliament. The minute you mention social class, the heads go down and people start looking at their phones. And it, um, you know, you, you can just sense the atmosphere that they think that it's a here's a dinosaur out again. When actually, class the, the class division is is the division in our society. The division in my community. And the, the division that's causing uh, the deaths that we're seeing, um, and, and and again, I, I think it's uh, very important what you say about taking lessons from other movements that have made fundamental change. You know, none of the uh, rights workers' rights that trade unions have won over centuries have been won because people on high hand them down. They've been they've been won because people have demanded them from below and they've forced government to act. 
uh, and I think that's what that's what's required here. At the last time I spoke on the drugs issue in Parliament, um, I said the last thing we need is consensus. It's consensus that's got us to where we are at the moment. Consensus and ambivalence has got us to where we are at the moment. And what we need is some well-directed anger for change. And uh, I absolutely stand with that. So thanks for all the um, contributions. Now, we have got people um, who've been posting some um, questions and I'll, I'll just so that we can make this workable rather than calling people I'll, I'll, I'll read the questions out and say who they're from um, it is going to be a wee bit tricky for us to identify who is going to answer I don't require all the speakers to answer all of the questions but if there's one that you've got a particular knowledge of or interest in answering then please um, indicate and I'll try and bring whoever it is and I hope that's okay if we run out of time don't worry we will be saving the questions so we'll try and get back to you in some way by uh, through some of the, the, the panel members. Just I think that's the only way we can really manage it with the numbers that we've got on. So um, I'll, first one I'll, uh, is a question from Erin uh, McCauley who says, I'm interested to know what has been done around street drugs and the rapid rise of young people taking this and dying from them. I know if I was uh, under 18, I could get a drug cheaper and easier than asking an adult to go into a shop, uh, presumably for alcohol. Um, what do people see as being uh, done in terms of uh, young people and their access to drugs? And that kind of links to a, a, a point raised by Joyce McPhee about children taking drugs under 16s uh, and their access to drugs. Would anybody want, anybody want to answer that? Fiona? We need to regulate all drugs. Um you won't have an elite, well, you will have us maybe 13%, but certain drugs are dangerous and that's why we need to regulate them all. So you make them legal and you regulate them. And if you want to find out how you do that, I've not got it with me just now. I know Martin Powell's on here. Um, there's a book that's been written. It's, we know how to regulate drugs. We're just choosing not to. Okay, thanks, Fiona. Anyone else want to come in on that? Um, I can only see a certain number of people uh, from the panel, so if anybody does want to come in, please just, just speak. Neil, yeah, well, I think uh, it's Barry here. I yeah. think Fiona, Fiona's kind of hit the nail on the head. Regulation of drugs is required right across all drugs. So I actually know what people are taking. You know, and, and that's it. Hit the nail on the head for me. I just say quickly as well, uh, Professor Alex Stevens, um, he's got like a 15 minute TED talk, it's called Pro Progressive Legalization. And I think that's definitely worth looking at as well as uh, transforms, um, transforms stimulants and how to regulate them. Um, I think the only, the only, you know, like what I see with the problem with straight away legalization, and regulation of all drugs is I mean you, you're talking about a billion dollar, multi billion dollar industry from farmers in Afghanistan and Mexico all the way through to, to the, the 14 and 15 year olds running about Glasgow, up and down the city centre of the Argel Street, day in, day out, making money on their push bikes, selling street blues, you know, because that's what's happening. Let's get it right. We're not talking about just youngsters taking drugs, we're talking about youngsters selling drugs. You only have to go and stand next to a street beggar in Glasgow City Centre for 10 minutes, 10 minutes and I'll guarantee you, you'll have a kid going by 14 or 15 year old on a push bike. You want any blues? You want any blues, pal? Because that's how it is. We've got a built built multi-billion dollar industry so transforms drugs on how you how to re regulate st stimulants actually talks about all of that in terms of how how to deal with it because do you have these capitalist organizations coming in and taking over the whole market but what we do see is studies coming out of places in america who have actually legalized cannabis is the upturn and youngsters actually taking cannabis has actually went down so that's worth looking at thanks peter thanks for that um we've got a point from um just a wee second ewan uh, Ewan Gurr, who says, uh, my question for the panel is, do they consider a harm reduction approach as the best solution to address uh, addiction or simply as one part of a bigger jigsaw? Anybody want to come in on that? Neil, let's face it, it's really about choice. This is, this is about choice. 
Can you read the question again, Neil? Um, Ewan's asking, is, uh, is a harm reduction approach the best solution to address uh, the problems of addiction or just some, simply as one part of a much bigger jigsaw? Uh, my own view, I'll, I can just take this quickly. <clears throat> my own view is that the harm reduction approach has not evolved much since its inception, which was to deal with uh, the criminality associated with heroin use in the 90s. So the harm reduction model did deal with a number of issues, uh, including obviously when you get someone on methadone, then they don't have to score every other hour. And you know, there's, there's a certain stability in their life, but obviously we know that there are far too many people who have subsequently been parked on methadone. So unfortunately, because of a lack of investment, and also I, would, I, I believe a kind of, not necessarily vested interest in the sense that it's usually, uh, the sense that it's usually uh, meant, but there's a sort of intellectual status quo currently, which uh, doesn't really consider the abstinence-based approach as 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 worthy of of uh, really looking at. The ultimate aim should be, in my view, as a as an advocate of abstinence-based recovery, to get someone to a place where they don't require any mind or mood altering substances to function. So, unfortunately. What we have now is uh, we, we've, we've set the bar so low that within that status quo, uh, someone who's been on methadone for 10 or 20 years, that kind of flashes up as like a success. When actually, uh, in the grand scheme of things, until you are actually completely free of, 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 of addiction and in full possession of your faculties, then you can't address the fundamental problems with you uh, and your trauma and all of the other reasons that people become addicted because there's a part of you which is still enslaved. Um, now, I know that some people find it difficult to hear advocates of abstinence-based recovery talk passionately from, from a place of experience about the power of abstinence. Um, but unfortunately, I think that when we aren't when we aren't setting the ultimate goal to be abstinence, then we settle for less. And less means death. Less means generational addiction. Less means the, the needless reproduction of the traumas and dysfunctions that create the likelihood for more addiction and dysfunction to arise. Um, so I think harm reduction is a part of the puzzle. Absolutely. Some people need to be brought down incrementally from whatever substance they're using and whatever amounts they're using. But what really upsets me is that a person on a very high dose of methadone can be safely detoxed in a rehab within two weeks. Why are people ending up on it for 20 years? Makes no sense to me. Thanks, Dan. Um, Thanks for that. Anybody else want to come in on that? Quick, quickly, uh, Neil. Yep. For me, in terms of everybody's going on a person centered and rights based approach, why not sit down with a person and say, What do you want? Do you want, in terms of presenting services, right? You need to tackle your chaotic, chaotic use, right? Get them stabilized and say, Right, what do you want? Your treat, do you want to uh, stable in your methadone, or do you want a, a kind of moderate recovery, or do you want absent recovery? And how do we, how can we work as a partnership? To get you where you want to go. It's as simple as that. A partnership approach between the worker and the, and the, and the person accessing services. And again, there's a polarised debate between harm reduction versus abstinence. I'm a punter. I'm in lived experience for more than 20 years. But I don't actually want to come out and say it publicly because there'll be a glass ceiling. I'll not be taken serious in terms of because I'm in recovery. I'm also a policy professional, an academic, but as a concerned citizen as well. I know now I'll not be taken serious now because I'm in recovery. I'm not an advocate of abstinence recovery or harm reduction. So whatever a person wants, ask them, have that conversation. Barry, I think, there's, I think I, it's Tracy, I think there's something though, but don't, don't tell people they have choice when they realistically don't have choice. And ultimately, I mean, that's that's what I see in terms of work I do recovery and, and work I do still in addiction. So 
I don't think everybody is getting that choice about, I think there is a sense of, well, actually, the only option for you is medication. I think everybody should have the choices of different approaches, but I don't think that's, well, you know that, that's not the reality. So it would be great to sit down with folk and say, listen, you've got a choice, you've got four or five different ways you want to do this, what, do you, what way do you want to go? But I think realistically, and locally, oh. across Scotland, there isn't that choice. They don't have the choice about all the different ranges that potentially could be on offer. I feel that we're falling back I'm into on. the argument. Can I just, we're falling back into those arguments like, you know, there are no good and bad people and no. there's no good and bad drugs. There's just mm -hmm. bad policy. Yeah. Can we Agreed. keep the focus can I, can I, can I, I Can I come off this? How did I get back onto this so I can get mute myself? Just mute yourself. I'd just come in quickly as well on that. <clears throat> I would totally agree with, 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 with what Tracy says there. I mean, we, like, we've got this massive amount of uh, world-renowned residential rehabilitation centres. You know, we've got 116 re bed residential rehabilitation centre in the Scottish borders, and there's nobody from Scotland in that facility. You know, it's like, it's absolutely insane. We have got a basic need for harm reduction because we need to keep people alive. But then if we cannot get them into different types of treatment, what is the point? You know, it's like we've got Phoenix Futures in Glasgow and people from Glasgow can't even get into that residential rehabilitation centre. Sorry to say, but the people that are coming week upon week to my supervised consumption facility are never going to be able to pay the thousands upon thousands of pounds to get into one of these treatment centres. These places should be getting funded directly from the Scottish Government. It's no surprise that 10 years ago there was 200 people a year getting sent to Castle Craig and in 2019 they sent five people from the whole of NHS funding to that facility. 116 beds and 90% of those beds are taken up by people from Holland when we've got a 10 times worse drug death rate than what the, what the, the Dutch have. It's absolutely insane. It's the money, the money. It's yeah. all about money. Uh, it's shocking. If I can just come in and give my tuppence worth, Neil. Um, for, for me, I don't think <sighs> dividing us into tribes and camps uh, while it's it's useful um, for, for debating purposes, I'm neither an academic nor a person with lived experience. I can be both. Uh, and for me, the question was about well, what should we be doing? Should it be abstinence-based recovery or harm reduction uh, or, or ask the person what it is they need? For me, I think looking at just the individual as a source of the problem is part of the issue. And I don't think we should necessarily constantly be doing that. I agree that some people are numbing their pain. I agree with that completely. But at the same time, the conditions that we see, the people that have got major drug problems, the conditions that they live in, the, the things that Aidan was, was talking about, uh, his experiences uh, in terms of school, and, and what Peter and, and, and uh, Darren have, have spoken about, and, and, and Fiona and Tracy, all of these individual experiences, it shows quite clearly that, that where somebody lives has got a huge bearing on what they're doing and whether they use drugs in a problematic, ma problematic manner or not. Quality of life is extremely important. Of that, there is no doubt. Hogarth back in the, the mid 18th century demonstrated with his simple engraving Beer Street and Gin Lane that the rich back then just believed that consuming gin, gin caused poverty. They didn't realise that cramming people into tiny houses and taking away their ability to live off the land where they were free and had autonomy was going to drive them into the need for intoxication. The simple experiments laid out by Johann Harry in his book on the work of Bruce Alexander demonstrated quite clearly when you put rats into a cage and you traumatise them, of course they will use drugs to the exclusion of everything else. But when you give them good quality of life, they will not use drugs. They don't need to. Thanks, Ian. I, I think... Um, one of the things maybe just add to that, and you know, I recently spoke to a group of um, uh, people going through uh, addiction, and uh, one of the things that they were speaking about was um, they can have as many conversations as they want with their GP about 
uh, methadone and whether that's increasing or reducing, but they cannot get a conversation about how to get off all drugs. That's and that's the conversation they wanted, and they said that was because their GP regarded um, being illicit, drug free, and crime free as being success, um, and they didn't regard that as being success. Um, but that was their um, that that was their view. Um, we're just going to Barry's going to post. Um, his letter and his email address online for people to have a look at and it's an, an open letter that will go to the government I, I think I think Barry might have addressed it to the First Minister but to go to the government about some of the issues that have been raised in this and um, he will also post his email address so um, what we're really looking for is people we don't really need the now within the last 15 weeks a big debate about around the letter it's really for people to see you can go to, back to your organizations or your families or your community and discuss it if you want to sign up then make contact let Barry know that if it's yourself in an individual capacity if it's part of a group then that you're willing to sign and I think we're going to put a closing date of a week on it um, to try and so they um, get a bit of discipline into folks so it doesn't drift on for ages um, but um, so that we can get that response and obviously on the back of the statistics uh, tomorrow so that will be done just in the next wee while and again we said we will um, we will save all the comments and, and, and uh, chat. A um, couple of other questions Susan Sharkey says the police are on the front line uh, often using outdated laws uh, what about decriminalisation of people who use drugs and uh, comprehensive diversion schemes like in Thames Valley and I know having looked at this there's been good diversionary work in Durham and the East Midlands and, and, and areas like that. Um, these, 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 organ these areas are operating under the same laws as we have and um, therefore there's no reason why we couldn't be doing that but maybe uh, uh, one of the panel would like to comment on that. Yeah, I'll come in on that quickly, Neil, because I've had lots of lots of uh, <laughs> conversations in, uh, with the police, and I've obviously had the the charge, which I'm sure most people are aware of, um, which I'll not discuss. I wasn't wanting to discuss that with Joe Fitzpatrick in the meeting that he set up for two weeks and then cancelled the day before. Um, but there you go. Um, but yeah, every single officer that I've spoke to, every single one without fail, and I've probably spoke to thirty or forty police officers now all agree that the Misuse of Drugs Act is outdated, that we need reform to the Misuse of Drugs Act and there needs to be changes in terms of decriminalisation. The, po the point is that that's actually something that could be done in Scotland already. The Lord Advocate was quoted recently in the Holyrood magazine where policing and crime is devolved. That's a ma entirely a matter for him. We've already seen diversion schemes coming into place like West Midlands and other police forces throughout England and Wales, there is no reason that that can't happen in Scotland without uh, waiting for a change to the, the, the Misuse of Drugs Act to, to actually take place. So we, we continuously bang on about devolved powers and not devolved powers when we already have the powers here through policing and crime to use these diversion schemes. My ultimate goal is that the Lord Advocate will step forward and the diversion scheme will be, excuse me, you can't you shouldn't publicly inject those drugs in that dirty alleyway. Why don't you just walk around the corner to that drug consumption facility? You can inject your drugs in there and you can also engage with a range of support services to get on to things like heroin assisted treatment treatment, medication assisted treatment and potentially look at stabilising and one of the issues is we're, uh, that we're not going to ask you to do is we're not going to ask you to actually reduce once you get to a stable position we're not going to ask you to reduce in the communities that you were already traumatised and if you do want to do a structured reduction plan we'll send you to this 116 bed residential rehabilitation rather than actually having to reduce your methadone in the community that you've been traumatized and in the first place and criminalized in, in the first place we've got all these facilities that we can make use of so there's no reason it's, it's, it's absolutely outdated that we are talking about the misuse of drugs act when it comes to policing and crime so, and like I say, every officer, every single officer in a, on, on a one-to-one -one basis that I've spoke to in Glasgow City Centre over the last four months has all been in agreement. Something needs to change. We need to be doing something differently. They've actually said we wish the Lord Advocate would do something. We wish we had different powers to actually introduce different ways to deal with this problem rather than trying to criminalise people. 
Thanks, Peter. Anybody else want to come in on that point? No? Okay. Um, let's see, just another few questions before we finish. Um, Sally is saying, if Scotland is to be serious, as, uh, serious about uh, and a trauma-informed country, then the relationship dynamics need to be reflected at uh, a senior political leadership and service manager level, as well as in the frontline delivery of services. Um, people want to, Andrew, want to comment on that, Barry? I, as I said, thanks, uh, Neil, for letting us come in. As I said before, I would actually, in terms of the, the accountability, and also the governance of service, as I said earlier on, it has to be, I would fund myself, it has to be a standalone commissioning body that can hold um, poor performing organisations to account and also challenge on uh, whether they're delivered outcomes or at all. Because at the moment, we've not got a clear separation between purchaser and a provider of services. Again, voluntary sector services are held at a greater level of accountability. Um, but also we could have a, a, a statutory enforcement power in terms of a statutory body who an enforcement power. We've, we've got it in housing, we've got it in other areas, so why can we not just have it in addiction? We've got a public health crisis going on, but we just want to push it, put, uh, push it foot around the place. And again, back to the saying, we're all going on about system change, but does the system actually want to change? Do we actually be, want to be radical? Because I've seen in the last year, everybody's want to be radical. They're just tinkering about the edges. That's all. We want to be person-centred, rights-based. Well, why not look at this? We've, we've got an opportunity here. If we've got political will, we've got the kind of, the kind of leadership, well, just in terms of Scottish government, down to the local, local level, that there has to be a, a political will for this. And this, this could be an echo chamber. And we're all talking, we all agree on things or disagree on a couple of things, but we've not got the power. No, so we have to hang up, maybe look at it in terms of funding, accountability and commissioning. We've got, we've got far worse outcomes in relation to England and Wales. Why is that? No, so again, thanks for getting, I've got actually gone to mute now, so thanks Neil. Um, thanks. Um, Chris, Chris Johnson has asked um, what we're going to do about fixing drugs services. Is it just more resources or is it uh, attitudes that needs to change also? Um, do you want to come in on that for the panel? I'm going to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hearts and minds. You know, I think there's a combination of different things. We need the political leadership, but we also need distributed leadership right across the piece at every level. But communities need to be part of this process as well. So we need it at absolutely every level. And I think there is a general consensus. Now there's a there's a swell I think that we should really be taking advantage of in the next in the next wee while. Can I come in? I think in terms of for decades now, it's top down policy. It doesn't work. I'm a, I'm, it has to be a bottom-up approach in terms of policy making, in terms of funding, accountability, and have communities have the ability, again back to what I was saying, come up with area-based solutions to the area-based problems. I've worked in communities, I've worked shoulder to shoulder, and one of the most rewarding roles I've ever done is work shoulder to shoulder with community organisations who could go out and deliver solutions themselves. And for myself, all through my career, you see policy, we know what's best. Like everybody goes on about co-production, but that's just, that's, that's just terminology. It's no true co-production because there's co-delivery, transformational co-production. Communities have to be having a say in delivering it so the money actually stays within the communities. So they can actually, you know, they can actually take it forward themselves. That, for me, that's radical, and also looking at the systems. Again, that, that, that's my top is worth, and thanks for letting me come in. Folks, we're in the last couple of minutes, and I suppose this is one of the key points, um, uh, you know, where we go from here, as um, uh, Darren said, you know, um, talking about escalating this issue and taking it to 
a different level so that we're making demands similar as we've seen from you know trade unions and black lives matter and the LBG, lgbt movement and others over the years and um, so what we're going to do i suppose is the question and i don't know if darren has a few suggestions first of all but um, you know, I certainly have got some ideas, but if it's coming for me, then it will be deemed as being, uh, you know, political opportunism and all that kind of stuff. Whereas I couldn't give a damn about the party politics of this. People in my street are dying, and that's what I want to address. So um, I I'm happy to work with MD. I couldn't care what party you're in or what party you support on this issue. Um, but I think we need a broad based, uh, bottom up campaign that's going to force political change like we have seen over the centuries with other um, causes and other organisations. But Darren, do you want to come in on that? Darren's left. Oh, he's, he's left. Well, uh, does anybody else want to come in on that issue? I think it's slightly off point, but 90 we have to remember 90% of people who use drugs, all drugs except for alcohol and tobacco, which are really, really addictive, 90% of people do not use problematically. Where are they in this debate? They're missing. And I think until we stand up and say, it's a complex issue and we keep looking at the people who are problematic and building policy on that. And what I'm here to say is, yeah, I did use problematic, problematically. Drugs were, catastro drugs were damaging to me. The policies were catastrophic. And 30 years later, I am still impacted by them. They killed my communities. And I'm, not, and I'm not defending drug use, but it was not drugs that killed my friends. It was bad policy. It was drug over, and that's what's killing our communities now. That's why they're getting killed at such high rates. You do not see this in Switzerland. You do not see this in countries that treat people, treat drug use as a human rights issue. It is nobody's business what we put in our bodies. And it becomes, it, it's important that we look after the problematic drug users, but until we have a community that's willing to just stand up and say it's complex, it's really, really complex. And it's, I don't know, I can't, I can't quite get to who's missing in this conversation, but we do need to always frame it as human rights. And there's been so much talk today about the community of problematic drug users. Um, that as, as long as we see that huge personality, we're avoiding the issue. The issue is not people, the issue is policy. I agree wholeheartedly. Can I just say as well, like one of the key things for me is that we need to, we need to look at our prescribing services in Scotland. Um, I just, I, I just can't get my head around that we have this whole extra tier for people to get to get to a, a, a prescription. Somebody there, it's in the point where they are most likely to die. And the, the, for me, the, 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 I'm an abstinence-based recovery. I'm a big advocate of abstinence-based recovery. You know, it's absolutely wonderful. I've got two children and a beautiful wife and um, two beautiful dogs and all that stuff in my life because of my abstinence-based recovery, because I, I stay in that, and because I'm one of that part of that 10% when I use drugs, I do it to extremes. But I think in terms of just getting people on a prescription where they can stabilise and then we can refer them into other services, that having to go through that extra level and that extra tier is an absolute farce. Why is, why is all prescribing in Scotland controlled by the NHS? Mm -hmm. If somebody goes to the GP, their GP who they've got a relationship with for years potentially, the GP won't even prescribe. We've all probably seen the signs in the GP's practice, practice in Glasgow. We do not prescribe X, Y and Z. You know, we've all seen those signs and GPs won't in general just won't prescribe, they'll send you to the third sector. So you go to your GP asking for help, you go to the third sector organisation asking for more help, and then you have to go to the NHS and ask for even more help. Why? 
why is it like that? We need to build it, rebuild the system from the bottom up, and it can be built with a very little amount of money spent on it. And there's been a lot of talk about money and mismanagement of money and money being redirected. £20 million given to the Drug Death Task Force, which has filtered down to so many research projects. When we've got the research, we've got research. I think Anne-Marie's on this call, and I've heard her say it before, we've got research absolutely coming out our ears, not just in Scotland, but from around the world that we can use to implement the changes that we need in Scotland right now. I agree with you, Peter. We've got all the evidence we need. We didn't need the Drug Deaths Task Force to fund more research. We've got everything we need already here. We just need to hold those services that helped add to the risk factors for drug-related deaths to be held accountable. And the only way to do that is to break their stranglehold, as you mentioned, Peter. And as Tracy mentioned, where are the people? Where are the representatives? in these meetings are not there precisely because they have the people that make up the alcohol and drug partnerships, the people that make up the integrated joint boards, the NHS. They report directly to government because the government are so terrified they expected the NHS to be able to prescribe their way out of this crisis. That hasn't worked, has it? Okay, folks, we've, we've hit six o'clock, so we've had a good go at that. Listen, thank you. I just want to thank everybody. I think we could have went on for a long time yet. And uh, thanks for so many people joining us today. Can, we can see there's a clear appetite for us to continue with the pressure, to build the pressure. And to, I, think, I think people are looking for us together to build a campaign collaboratively and collectively to force change. So I think we need to put our heads together after this and think about how we're going to do that. Um, I'll certainly speak to uh, some of the panel about that and see see what our next step is. Barry has posted his letter and his contact details. People can have a look at that. Um, and you know, you can decide whether you want to support him in that. Um, can I also point out that Fiona has an event on Wednesday, Fiona? Um, and the details, I think, are in the chat box, chat uh, facility. We'll leave that. We'll leave the meeting kind of running a wee while, just so if anybody wants to look through some of the chat and pick up on any of the stuff, you can. So we'll not just um, uh, click that off right away. But just to say thanks, a huge thanks to everybody. I think there's a lot of food for thought, and um, I think we're all sort of might have a bit of a sleepless night waiting to see what the statistics bring tomorrow. Um, uh, because I think it looks like that we're going to see record numbers of families having lost um, loved ones over that last period. Um, um, and it's up to us, I think, I think us and people like us to drive change because we're not seeing that change coming down from on high. So that's, that's certainly, I think, the next um, piece of work that we need to get stuck into. Um, if anybody wants to contact me about any of these issues, please do. I'm always happy to speak to people on this issue or any of the politicians that are on that have been on the call would, you know, please contact them. Contact your local MSPs, councillors and MPs and pressure them. You've got every right to do that and ask them what they're, they're doing about the drugs death crisis in this country. They're the people who can influence uh, budgets, influence decision making and either speak up or sit silent. That's the choice they've got to uh, they've got to make, and they will only speak up, in my view, if you pressure them and demand that they speak up on this. So thanks very much. They have a um, safe uh, Christmas and a new year. Hopefully soon we'll be out of this horrible situation we're in, and we can meet in person to start to plan how we try and change what is um, a, a massive crisis in working class communities like the ones that many of us are working in. Thanks very much. Okay. Cheers. Thanks for all the panellists.